Somebody just sent a very nice message saying, bless all our efforts. That's really lovely, isn't it? I think we really need to give ourselves some blessings sometimes and just to acknowledge our efforts, you know, all of us. Because we all have different lives. We maybe have different struggles to surmount. Obviously, different mind states, different situations, context for practice, different experience on the path. That's just really lovely. It's not easy, but this is the way. Bless all our efforts. Thank you very much to the person who sent that lovely, encouraging message. It encourages me as well. So this evening, I wanted to talk about what is possibly, mm, I can't say my complete favorite subject, but certainly one of them because there can't really be hierarchies when it comes to the Dhamma. But I wanted to talk about the beautiful, powerful, unconditional loving kindness that is um, such an important part of the Buddhist path and practice. Um, sometimes people think of loving kindness as sort of an add-on or something a little bit superfluous perhaps, or even just a bit of a feel-good meditation that's not really the real thing, it's not the deep Dhamma. But I would actually say that it's, it is deep Dhamma, because one of the measurements of wisdom is how kind you are, you know, how, how much loving kindness you're developing in your heart. How is your heart actually being transformed? That's much more important to me than, you know, what kind of experiences people have on the cushion from time to time, or even how much you think you know. You know, if that's not translating into your everyday life in ways that helps you treat others and yourself with more kindness, with more respect, maybe giving them more space, you know, giving yourself and others the chance, the opportunity, the forgiveness to make mistakes then really what is this path about? You know, if we can't be kind to ourselves, can't be kind to others, then we still have a lot more wisdom to develop, I think. Because after a while we start to see that there isn't really any abiding self in here, it's a process. And whatever's arising is arising due to causes and conditions. You know, it's very impersonal. And if somebody else had very similar causes and conditions in their external life or maybe in their way of you know, the way they were brought up or educated, then they would also be experiencing something very similar to what we're experiencing right now. So these kind of reflections can really help a sense of um, compassion, loving kindness, forgiveness to arise in the heart. And there are many kinds of love in the world, but this is the kind of love that the Buddha praised as the most exalted sort of spiritual love. And it's different from worldly love because it doesn't always come with a feeling of, elation or kind of pleasure in a sensual way. In fact, it's quite different from what he calls um, karma, which is sensual love or desire. Or um, there's another word, which I forget now, for love, that means more of um, a sensuality, you know, love with a lot of attachment involved. But this kind of love is more of a benevolence. It's a kind of wishing others well wishing for the well-being, for the safety, for the welfare of all beings, whether we like those beings or not, whether we're liked by those beings or not, whether we like those beings or not, right? It doesn't matter if they look like us, if they sound like us, whether they're from the same race, the same gender, the same country. It really doesn't matter. This kind of loving kindness recognizes our common humanity and recognizes that all beings have a wish for their own welfare, for their own happiness and ease. And so it's this sort of benevolence that is also known as one of the Brahma Viharas, uh, which literally means a divine abiding. And it's a place that we can rest. It's a place that we can cultivate in our own hearts as a kind of sanctuary, a kind of refuge that we can return to again and again and again to become resourced, nourished, rejuvenated, and of course, to be free from ill will, animosity, hostility, and resentment. You know, we can learn to let go of petty grudges, of things that you know, create obstacles in our relationships. There's nothing worse than sort of not being able to forgive another being and then carrying that with you throughout life so that it hardens the heart. You know, today we talked a lot about dying, about death. And I think for me, one of the beauties also of the death contemplation is to realize that if I die tonight, 
what kind of unfinished business is there? You know, are the people that I haven't forgiven, are the people that I still have resentments towards? Are the things in myself that I haven't forgiven? Things in myself that I'm still trying to change that I haven't really embraced or accepted. And it can be quite sobering, you know, to contemplate in this way because there isn't really anything good <laughs> about grudges, about, you know, not being able to forgive that we want to carry over with us into death, into the dying process, and certainly not into future lives. So it tends to put things into perspective very much when we think in this way. And love and kindness is also impartial. You know, it goes to all, to, to all as to oneself, it says frequently in the suttas. And a nice simile of that is like the way that the sun shines on all beings, or like the way that the rain in England, you know, it just rains on everything. It doesn't choose our rain on this tree, but not on that tree, you know, because this one, I don't know, looks prettier or this one has flowers. This one is just an old kind of scraggy tree. I won't bother raining on that. No, it rains on everything. <laughs> and yesterday I went to my favorite park just very briefly between showers. And uh, there's these two incredibly majestic uh, copper beech trees and one of them is, uh, it's really beautiful to see them because they sort of stand next to each other. And I often think one looks more like a, a female and one looks more male. And the tree that to me is more, has a sort of feminine energy is very broad and expansive and sort of with branches like this and very wide roots and deep roots. And the other one is also extremely deeply rooted and just shoots up to the sky like this. And, uh, the, the one which is broad, it always bears the leaves first, quite early on in the season. And you look at the second one, and I think when I first moved here, I, I was watching the second one thinking, what's wrong with that? Maybe it's died or something because it doesn't have any leaves. But after a while, it started to uh, also have leaves. And yesterday, I hadn't been there for a while, and suddenly it was completely full of leaves. It was absolutely splendid. And it just reminded me, you know, of, um, of this process of meditation, because sometimes we don't know when, you know, the practice is going to give rise, in this case, to beautiful copper beech leaves. You know, everything kind of flowers and fruits and comes to its fulfillment in its own time, according to its particular causes and conditions. Yeah. And all we really need to do in that time is just give ourselves the nourishment to bring those um, results about. So in the case of a tree, you know, it just needs to have enough sunshine, enough rain for it to get initially established. And then, you know, for those conditions to um, continue to be suitable for that tree to grow really deep roots and eventually the leaves will come. And so even sometimes we can look at people in life and it's, you know, sometimes really challenging to find a way to develop metta, say, for somebody who is inflicting immense harm on other beings, you know, maybe torture, maybe, you know, complete um, things that go completely against human rights, that really violate human rights, you know, the racism in the world. There are so many examples of things that just seem incredibly cruel, you know, marginalizing various groups of people based on their gender or sexuality. And sometimes we can think, gosh, you know, it, it, it can be hard to develop metta and understanding towards such people. But I think as meditators, one of the beautiful things is that we start to notice that whenever there's a lack of metta in our hearts, we suffer. We're the first to suffer. And it's only through that lack of loving kindness that we're able to inflict harm upon others. You know, so imagine if somebody has that much anger, that much hatred and delusion that they can do terrible things to another human being. Surely these people too deserve our loving kindness, or at least if we can't develop loving kindness, compassion, compassion. You know, may they too come out of suffering. May they too experience peace, experience harmony, because when they do, they're not going to be able, they're actually not going to be able to inflict harm on others. And so loving kindness is an antidote at such a deep level you know, not just at a superficial level of not generating irritation or aversion to things we don't like, but actually eradicating this tendency to um, wanting to harm anyone else, because we simply don't have the capacity to do that anymore in our heart. You know, we can actually free ourselves from, um, from all anger. 
And yesterday also, um, somebody was asking about the relationship between anger and fear and whether fear is in the same kind of category as you know those other um, aversive states of mind. And it's interesting because in the suttas, the first place or one of the first times I think that the Buddha taught metta meditation was actually to help overcome fear, not to help overcome aversion. So I think that's quite interesting. And Ajahn Brahmali was talking about how, um, as he's saying, aversion can lead to fear. But I think it's the opposite as well. You know, fear of others is often what leads to our hatred towards our animosity. People don't look like us, people don't sound like us, you know, we're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of the unknown, especially sometimes in our meditation. You know, things might be fine as long as we're with the object that we're familiar with, but then when things start to get a little bit deeper, you know, maybe the breath starts to disappear or different images might arise in the mind and you kind of don't quite know where you are with things and fear can arise because you're losing a sense of you know knowing what to expect and with that in a way you feel you may be losing control and so this metta also is an antidote to fear and it came up in the context where there were some monks that went to the forest to practice meditation in the night I think they were supposed to stay there all night and uh and there were these strange noises and sounds and they could feel that were like these invisible beings were around and fear arose. And I think in the sutta, it's talking about the kind of fear that is, uh, makes your hair stand on end. You know, so you can imagine in the middle of the night and you don't know what this is, like, is it a wild animal? Is it a ghost? Yeah, especially there was a lot of uh, beliefs even today in many um, Buddhist countries about the presence of spirits and ghosts. And actually those ghosts can never harm us because they're, they're actually afraid of beings who have um, a lot of goodness. You know, we actually have more power as human beings in a sense, the power of goodness, the power of virtue. But they, uh, they kind of lost it for that period of time and went back to the Buddha and said, oh, don't ever send us to such a place again. You know, this is terrible. We can't meditate here. And the Buddha prescribed loving kindness. He said, you know, you didn't have enough loving kindness. So practice loving kindness and then go back to that place. So it can also be a powerful antidote to things like fear of death, right? And I actually had a little scare a couple of years ago. I had a melanoma on my arm, sort of out of the blue, but not really because this mole had been growing for many years. So when I started reading about prognosis and it was saying, you know, in the first like six weeks, it can go to curable to fatal. I was like, oh my goodness. This was really a shock. And uh, there was a gap between sort of being diagnosed and knowing the prognosis, like whether it had spread. And uh, it was really interesting in that time to notice that even though I would think, you know, I'm just being calm with it, everything's, you know, everything will get worked out in the end. From time to time, I'd be just going about ordinary daily things. And I'd get this visceral kind of tremor coming right up through my body, like a kind of shudder in a way almost right through my bones. And actually, my other really compelling experience was a lot of metta at the same time. It was almost like these two things were coexisting and maybe even augmenting each other to some degree or that the um, metta would come almost as a result of that fear or maybe a response to it. So there'd be this like opening of the heart and this, I don't know if it also you know, the, the idea that I can die much sooner than I would like to. Of course, that's always the case. But when it actually is a real reality, it's very different than any death contemplation. Um, so when that would happen, it was almost like it blew away any sort of pettiness, any narrow mindedness. And I just felt genuine love for the beings that were around me. It was actually a very beautiful experience. And perhaps also that sort of fear was a kind of softening of the heart, you know, a kind of being in touch with my own vulnerability, my own fragility, and realizing, yeah, what really matters in the end is just our own goodness. It's just the qualities that we develop in our heart. So I do want to talk just briefly before we do some meditation, a little bit about how we can use loving kindness in our practice. And um, I practice in two main ways. So the first one is what I started to point to yesterday, 
of loving kindness, or if you like, an attitude of kindness towards whatever arises in this experience of body and mind. So actually learning to infuse our mindfulness with loving kindness. And this is straight from the noble path, the eightfold path. The second factor of the eightfold path is right intention. And one of those right intentions is avyapada, which is non-ill will. It's a synonym for loving kindness, benevolence, um, this kind of beautiful friendliness, protective love. So we can infuse and we should infuse our mindfulness with these right intentions. So there's no such thing really as bare awareness. You know, Most of the time our bare awareness is infused with our conditioned ways of being aware, right? So we might think we're just being aware, but our mind will be reacting, you know, at some level, whether it's subtle or whether it's, you know, very obvious, very coarse, it will be reacting with a certain amount of wanting it or not wanting it. But when we actually learn to look at things through the lens of kindness, so to speak, you know, so that our mindfulness is our eyes and the loving kindness is like, um, a nice glass with a little bit of a rose tint, bearing in mind that all glasses have tints, even bare awareness has a tint in this synonym, simile. Um, it's usually tinted with ill will actually. <laughs> so this loving kindness becomes like an antidote to those hindrances that can arise in meditation, just through using it as a perception, using it as an attitude to whatever arises. But there's also a practice where we use loving kindness as a cultivation in and of itself. And this kind of loving kindness can lead us all the way from momentary experiences. And the Buddha said, even to develop loving kindness for like a finger snap or the time it takes to pull a cow's udder, if you're a farmer, right? Just pull the udder. I don't know if it's that easy. <laughs> even then, it's more worthwhile than even giving um, food to the hungry, many, many pots of food to the hungry, even if you only develop it for that moment. And I think the reason is because you're working with the roots of the mind, you're working you know, with motivation, with intention, um, in a way that's going to eradicate defilements and produce more generosity, even more generosity than just a random uh, act of kindness over the longer term, you know, because you're actually changing your mind's motivation. So this is when we develop loving kindness, even for a short time, but we can cultivate it further, even use it if we wish as our main vehicle, as our main meditation, or you might want to just do one or two sessions a day, um, all the way into what we call the jhanas. So these deep states of absorption, deep samadhi, deep stillness of mind. And, uh, it carries this very beautiful, natural quality of happiness, of emotional warmth, of peace with it. And as such, metta is a very effective way of developing the deep meditation. Because the first um, necessary factors in cultivating any of these deep meditations are things like vitaka and vichara. So these are the first two jhana factors. Vitaka is like applied attention, if you like. And uh, vichara is like sustained attention. So vitaka, in the case of loving kindness, would be um, the phrase of loving kindness or maybe the image of a person who you're sending loving kindness towards. So it would be connecting with that phrase, connecting with that image. That would be the vitaka, yeah, that aspect of the mind that can direct its attention to the object. And then it would become vichara, the second jhana factor, when we're able to sustain our awareness with that. So that after we say the phrase in our mind, may you be happy, or whatever it might be, we listen to the resonance of that sound. Yeah. And we see where it's pointing our mind. So we kind of float with it, if you like, or we sail with it, or we kind of soar with that lovely resonance of the initial striking of the gong. So I think it's the Visuddhimagga. One of my teachers, Shaila Catherine, talks about um, the Visuddhimagga quite a lot. And I think in there, there's a simile of Vitaka and Chara, like, sorry, Vitaka and Vichara, like striking a bell is like Vitaka. And the ringing of that bell is like Vichara. So it, it continues to resonate, to echo, in this case, in the mind. And then the third factor of developing these deep states of meditation is Piti 
and then sukha. And both of these qualities point to a kind of rapture, a kind of inner happiness, a deep contentment. Yeah? And metta has this quality with it. It's almost co-joined with it. Metta is always a pleasant experience because we're softening the heart. Yeah? We're, we're purifying the mind from ill will. So it becomes light, it becomes buoyant. You know, it becomes very, a very pleasant experience. And the Buddha talks quite a lot in the suttas about the kind of happiness that we should cultivate and the kind of happiness to be avoided. And he says, you know, that the kind of wholesome happinesses that arise from things like practice of deep meditation should be pursued. They're not to be feared, they're to be cultivated, developed and made much of, brought to fulfillment. And so with metta practice, we can be sure that this is a wholesome kind of happiness. And even with metta, you know, that quality of, of joy, of, of happiness that arises in the heart will start off a little bit more coarse, you know, kind of a little bit agitated, maybe fairly strong. And then after a while, it will just start to settle and become much softer. And that will become a way into tranquility and the unification of mind. So this uh, practice of metta as the jhana actually brings out this quality of boundlessness, this boundless extension of loving kindness. The mind becomes mahagata, gone to greatness. It becomes big, it becomes wide. It can include all beings. It can include all of ourself. <laughs> you know, there may be parts of yourself that you can include in your metta, the good parts, me on a good day, me when I'm at my best. But there may be other parts of you that, you know, you're still excluding from that loving kindness that you feel need shaping up. Yeah. But it doesn't work to do that through ill will towards ourself. It can only work by embracing, by accepting ourselves as we are and sending metta, developing loving kindness, this wish for our own benefit, our own well-being. And gradually, this is what brings about the transformation. So it's not that we have to change who we are. It's more that we learn to accept we are and who others are as well realizing again that they are products of causes and conditions you know beings that are simply trying to do their best with what they have you know with the choices that they see ahead of them sometimes we might see choices that we might think well why didn't they do this why did they do it that way but maybe they didn't see those choices ahead you know we only ever have a limited amount of choices based on our conditioning, you know, only certain things, certain ways that we know how to be. And that's where it can be so empowering, so transformative to be around other beings who have developed these qualities to a very high degree. And Ajahn Brahm just gives a really lovely simile of when he met one of his favorite monks, um, Ajahn Tate, who was also a disciple of Ajahn Man. <clears throat> and, uh, and he said that he walked into this room, he had to make an appointment with this monk because uh, you know, he was quite a famous monk at that time and the king had built him this big palace, I think somewhere on the Lao Thailand border. And, uh, and he went there and he walked into this room feeling a little bit intimidated, you know, not really knowing what to expect. This person was supposed to be a great enlightened monk. Um, and the forest masters were pretty you know, ascetic you know, sitting up all night, not knowing if the tiger was going to come and eat them up <laughs> or sitting on perches, you know, in the trees that you could wobble off if you went to sleep. So he didn't quite know what to expect, but he walked in and he just saw this very gentle, quite frail, very humble, quiet monk sitting in the corner of this palace, which he seemed not at all to belong in. And he went up to this monk and paid his respect and he said, his mind just went blank, you know. He was just so overwhelmed by the aura, the kindness, the contentment and peace around this monk. And all he could think of to say was, sometimes all your questions just disappear and I suppose you just have to look for them inside or something like this. <laughs> so that's what Ajahn Brahm said. And, uh, and the monk was, hey, I, I, and it was such a short encounter, but it was quite life-changing. And he still speaks about that. He still speaks about it as a great source of sadha as well. Yesterday we talked about confidence or faith. And uh, he has had dreams actually about this same monk and visiting that monk's um, gravestone. Actually, I would have thought that he'd have a cremation 
rather than a gravestone, I'm not sure, but um, he has this dream anyway, I think around 20 years ago. And, uh, and he went, this is actually from in his dream, he went up to pay respects to this uh, shrine and saw the picture of Ajahn Tate. And in his dream, he just was so overwhelmed by sadha, by confidence, by inspiration, that he got this massive, bright nimitta, he said, brighter than a thousand suns. And then kind of woke up from the dream. And then he says he couldn't tell what happened next. <laughs> because monks and nuns are not really allowed to talk about those deep states of meditation, because that's seen as making a claim. But when he says, you know, that he couldn't say what happened next, that gives you the clue <laughs> that he got into some very deep meditation because that's sadha. And I guess sadha based on the loving kindness that he saw in that monk was the cause for him to, you know, basically at that time do away with any remaining hindrances that may have been in his mind and just go straight into some very deep blissful state. So this is really the power of these qualities. And the other thing I wanted to share, again, it's a story from Ajahn Brahm. I have to see if I can keep up with Ajahn Brahmali because he thinks he's got all the stories, but I actually have plenty too. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the other, the other nice one that he got from this meeting with Ajahn Tate was that um, a similar developed in his mind. He said what he felt was that so safe and so relaxed in the presence of this monk who was completely non-judgmental, you know, not expecting anything, not demanding anything from Ajahn Brahm at all. And he was just not Ajahn Brahm at that time. He was just a young monk, maybe in the first six or so years of his life, I think five or six years. And, uh, and then the simile arose to his mind, in his mind, what if I could do the same thing to those states of meditation, you know, or even just to my breath? What if I could be so welcoming, you know, what if my breath or these states of meditation could feel so safe and accepted with me in my presence, they would never want to leave me either. <laughs> so that's a really beautiful simile, I think, you know, because it really is about, somebody put the question in for Ajahn Bamali about um, whether it's mainly just about creating the conditions rather than trying to bring about these meditation states through will. Or craving and I would say absolutely the case the more I practice the more I realize that's really all we can do we can just try to lay down the foundations the conditions the fertile soil in a way and that's everything that's where we have our influence right we do that to the best of our ability through practicing with loving kindness with gentleness with a sense of letting go non-possession non-ownership not owning those people who you have this feeling of loving kindness towards, but letting them free, giving them freedom to be just as they are. You know, we're not trying to change ourselves or anyone else through this metta. We're simply wishing them well. So this loving kindness is incredibly deep. And I do believe it can take us actually all the way because as long as we can get into these deep states of samadhi where the hindrances are absent, and as long as we have, you know, at least some right view what they call preliminary right view or the right view of someone who's not yet enlightened, just enough to know the suffering. There is such a thing as a result of my actions that can bear good or negative results. This is enough right view. And also a little bit of right view into things like, you know, suffering, impermanence and non-self. Then when we do get into these deep states of meditation and the hindrances are removed, we really do have a chance to see things as they are because we have the word of the Buddha in our mind. It's called Paritagosa in Pali and it means literally the word of an Arya, the word of somebody else who's enlightened. So we know which direction to look in for the truth. And this, along with our own investigation, Yoni So Manisikara, the work of the mind that goes to the source, it literally means like really being able to look at where things are arising from. You know, where is greed, hatred and delusion arising from? You know, and how to overcome them with things like loving kindness, you know, which is an antidote to all of those, I think. Um, so through this, through these two things, the word of another and the work of the mind that gets to the cause of things, we have a chance to break through to stream entry. And that's how stream entry happens. Yeah, these two main factors. So I could talk a lot more, and I have, again, talked over my delegated time. <laughs> I delegated myself 15 minutes, but I'm using half an hour. But 
let's see tomorrow it might be shorter <laughs> but I just love this theme and we could talk in so much more detail but I would also really like to do a little bit of meta practice as well so you have another tool for your box <clears throat> So I'll give you <clears throat> a couple of minutes, but just, just take as long as you want <laughs> to settle into a comfortable position. Just looking at this lovely message again. It's not easy, but this is the way. Bless all our efforts. So nice. Thank you. Loving kindness from one participant to the rest. <laughs> so as usual with these uh, suggestions, please do take them that way. You may have your own ways of practicing may feel in the mood for some loving kindness practice or not and that's totally fine so if you want to follow the guidance you may if not just carry on in your usual way perhaps just infusing a little bit more warmth than you may usually do see if you can just soften around your experience without demanding it to be any other way. Maybe it's my conditioning with the practice or just something I feel is skillful, but I really like to start by developing right motivation establishing mindfulness along with kindness and just contacting the body sitting listening deeply whatever the body wants to express and making any necessary adjustments because this just shows your body that it's in a benevolent presence of your mind not a mind that wants to push it around find fault Make it sit through pain. Or the kind of mind that's a friend to the body, that cooperates with the body. Because this body is your vehicle and a source of learning and insight. You might also take a few moments to notice that we're sitting in a benevolent, friendly environment with people from all over the world who are somehow here together on the same screen, sharing their practice, sharing their company, and co-creating this safe, friendly space. And that you as one of them are also contributing, supporting the others by your practice. 
however you might measure that. It's kind of like trying to measure something that really can't be quantified or measured at all. You are supporting. You are holding space. And just allow that kind awareness, kindfulness to start soaking through the body. However feels most natural to you. You might start with the feet and imagine soaking up that mindfulness from the feet to the top of the head or from the head. as though that kindfulness is just flowing down, soaking through every single cell. Not trying to change what it contacts, but just being a companion to your experience. Shedding light, shedding kindness on whatever's happening inside. You might notice you find yourself relaxing in this friendly presence of the mind. And if not, that's fine. The light just shines anyway. keeps on imparting its warmth. If you wish, you can just continue in this way, allowing this kindfulness, kind awareness, loving awareness to meet any experience in your body and mind. Or if you wish, 
you might want to join the invitation to practice loving kindness. First of all, by bringing to mind a dear friend or maybe teacher, benefactor. <clears throat> Perhaps a parent or a child, maybe a pet, any living being do you feel a sense of kindness, benevolence, natural warmth and caring toward? You may take a few moments to choose someone. You may perhaps get an image of their face or a general sense of their presence. Perhaps imagining this person very gently walking toward you with a smile, perhaps sitting down next to you or in front of you. Noticing what it is about them, maybe some quality something in them that you really admire, respect. Bringing those qualities to mind. And regarding this person with kindly eyes, seeing their beauty, feeling that sense of safety, acceptance, ease in their presence. and sending them your loving kindness. And you may do this by connecting with your body with any pleasant sensations, imagining that those pleasant waves flowing outward, showering this dear person. Or maybe the loving kindness for you is like a golden light shining from your heart into theirs. Not making any effort, but just imagining this energetic exchange so that you know very clearly this person is the recipient of your loving kindness right now.
And if it helps, if it supports the process, you may wish to choose some phrases of loving kindness and just repeat them to yourself, inside yourself, as though offering them as a gift to this friend. So see if you can connect with your wishes for this being in your life. Keeping them very simple. Phrases such as, may I be, may you be happy. <clears throat> May you be free from suffering. May you be safe and well. May you be at peace. Just choosing between one and a maximum of four phrases. And repeating them calmly, clearly, infusing them with meaning and listening in the space between each phrase. Staying connected to the words and to the meaning. And sensing in the silence between each phrase to where these words are pointing. Trusting in the power of your intentions. Bring about the beautiful flower of loving kindness in your heart. Staying connected to your own sensations, especially any pleasant sensations in your own body. And again and again, connecting with the presence, maybe a felt sense or an image of your friend. Noticing how it feels to give just for the sake of giving without expecting anything, no special feelings or emotions, without expecting anything in return.
And any time you feel that too much effort is coming into the practice, just relax. You may wish to drop the phrases altogether or if the mind is becoming quieter, just go down to one single word. Whatever it is, just remembering the most important thing to do is stay present with kindness to whatever you experience. And for the last few minutes, we're going to practice some loving kindness towards ourselves. If you wish, your friend can stay present, or you can quietly, gently bid them farewell. And connect with your own deepest wish for yourself.
recognizing you too deserve your own loving kindness. just as much as the dearest person in your life. Offering yourself benevolent wishes of loving kindness and just letting them bear fruit in their own time. Allowing yourself also to receive any pleasant experience connected with loving kindness. Any sense of ease, comfort, maybe a softening in the body, a softening in the heart. Or even just opening up to the possibility of loving kindness towards yourself, towards every part of yourself. Mistakes, regrets and all. Staying connected to any pleasant results of this meditation. Any wholesome qualities you've developed in your heart as we end the meditation so that when you open your eyes, you don't so quickly throw it away so the effects of the meditation can continue. Guard the wholesome qualities. Keep connected to your inner goodness as we go into the next session. So today you get a little goal.
good. And you don't have to open your eyes. There's nothing much to see, to be honest. <laughs> Just your computer screen. So this evening we still have time for some questions. If there are any, maybe all questions have subsided now. Probably not. <laughs> and this evening, uh, Leonie is going to be receiving questions and then sending them over to me. So if you can pop them in the chat to Q and A Leonie, that would be wonderful. And just because there's a question session doesn't mean you have to fill it with words. It's uh, entirely up to you. Okay, that's interesting. The first question is <laughs> not really related to meta, but related to garlic, onion, and leeks. <laughs> the five pungent roots according to the Mahayana Shurangama or Shurangama Sutra. Um, what are my thoughts on trying to eliminate them from one's diet to aid progression along the Buddhist path with much thanks? Um, so not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I do eliminate garlic and actually all of them. Uh, and that is to progress along the path because they're not good for my health. That's the only reason, not because of any other sort of qualities in those things, because they can be very healthy for a lot of people. But in my case, they've got certain uh, FODMAPs, basically. Uh, anyway, short chain carbohydrates that I'm sort of uh, allergic to. So uh, for me, they're not much good. But I know, I don't know about the Mahayana um, understanding. I think it's maybe more the Chinese understanding probably because in India they have something similar. So in Indian medicine, I studied Ayurvedic medicine as my degree actually. Um, and in there, they're known as um, tamas, is it tamas, rajasic, which means that they incite the um, kilesas of things like greed and even lust. So they're a little bit stimulating basically. Um, and they usually don't use them in meditation centers in India. So all the Vipassana centers in India and Nepal, they, none of them use garlic or onions. But I also think it's out of politeness to the other retreatants because you're all sitting quite closely for long hours in meditation. So if everyone was eating a lot of garlic, it would be quite stinky. So, <laughs> yeah, but I think in Burma, I'm not so sure. I think they might still have those things in the center because garlic is in a huge amount of quantity used in a lot of, uh, in, in big quantities in, in Myanmar, in Burma. So yeah, not very much. I don't think that there's actually uh, much difference with people who eat it and people who don't. I haven't noticed any difference since I stopped eating it, unfortunately. <laughs> so the Buddha never really comments on kinds of food which um, would spur us on the path. He talks much more about, as in Ajahn Brahm's little joke, what comes out of our mouth rather than what goes in. So there's more scope to develop beautiful qualities of speech um, and, you know, beautiful virtue in our hearts than worry too much about what we eat. Of course, your diet may be more or less ethical, depending on what you choose to eat, according to your particular health situation, financial situation, etc. So there are always things we can do to live a little more kindly in terms of our diet. But, um, yeah, I don't think there's anything anywhere in the Buddhist text, except there is one Bhikkhuni Vinaya rule where we're not supposed to eat garlic, which is interesting because they usually ignore that rule. And that's the one that would most benefit me because I can't eat it. <laughs> but the reason is that um, a Bhikkhuni back 2,600 years ago apparently was, um, I think, if I get the background story right, and they're always a little bit um, not like literal texts, they're more commentaries. Um, but she was told she could take some garlic from a field, but she took lots and lots and lots and lots. That's one of the stories. And so then the Buddha said, um, I do not allow you to eat garlic or, or eating a lot of garlic is an offense to be confessed. So, so yeah, it's actually the first of the bikini patty mocha not to eat garlic. So, but <laughs> it's not because there's anything inherently wrong in garlic. So don't worry too much about it. So someone's asking, how do we show loving kindness to someone who has harmed us? 
Yeah. I don't think this practice of loving kindness is necessarily about showing it to others. It's more about cultivating it within our heart to overcome our own um, hindrances. So it's really a service to ourselves rather than it being a service to anyone else. But by, by virtue of purifying our own mind, purifying our own heart and intentions, we naturally benefit others. But, you know, I think in the case of somebody who's harmed us, especially if there was somebody close, it's really important to acknowledge your own hurt, first of all, and actually to turn that loving kindness on yourself. Use that loving kindness for yourself. And, and sometimes it's more appropriate to actually have compassion than loving kindness, because compassion is more the way that love or loving kindness responds when it meets suffering. So if you've been really harmed, especially if you've been maybe betrayed or abused, then you're the first person who's suffering, or at least you're the one who experiences that suffering, right? You don't experience that person's suffering, although they will also be hurting. Maybe not, maybe they don't know it, maybe they're not conscious of it, but certainly, you know, if they intentionally hurt you, then that is going to cause suffering for them later on. So, but the first thing you can do is address your own hurt wisely by relating to how you feel in a compassionate way. You know, may, my suffer, may I be free from suffering. You know? May I be kind to myself. May I be safe. May I be free from harm. May I be protected from harm. Whatever it is that may be helpful for you. Um, and also embracing emotions, other emotions that might come up like anger. You know, don't stigmatize anger. There may be anger that's arising. And, you know, again, we have, we have a choice. We can meet that anger with more anger and try and push it away and try and get rid of it, which is often a phrase meditators use. How do I get rid of this or that? Well, the Buddha doesn't teach us to get rid. He teaches us to first understand. And it's through understanding that we're actually able to abandon these things. And it's almost like a default automatic thing that happens, you know, when we really understand them. We learn to drop the unwholesome and cultivate the good. So um, be concerned more with that. And then maybe later when you've done, gone through some healing, you can actually meet that person and you'll find you do have some loving kindness in your heart. But personally for me, when you know dealing with the most, um, not the most difficult person in my life, but the person who hurt me the most, I actually intentionally avoided sending love and kindness to her at the time because it was too triggering it was traumatizing and it also detracted from dealing with my own pain but it was through the practice of loving kindness to the loved person and to other beings first to quite a, a great degree that I was able to I mean I didn't even intentionally spread it to that person it's more like that person popped into my mind in that meditation she like joined in with the flow of metta and it had zero impact. It was like the most easy and natural thing because I was resourced, you know. So the loving kindness naturally made the heart bigger and bigger and bigger until, you know, it just felt so easy. And all that sort of pain, all that trauma just pretty much dissolved. Of course, it wasn't straight away after, after the incident, but it was within the first one or two years. So give yourself time. And again, as Ajahn Brown says, or maybe someone else said it first, you can always love the tiger at a distance. So you can practice your loving kindness towards this person in a safe space, but you don't have to meet them. You know, you can uh, wait until you're ready. So there's some suggestions. Don't push yourself. And also we do have a regular ongoing meta class where we go by the, through these categories. And the traditional order for practicing loving kindness is to start with oneself. This is from the Visuddhi Magga. It's actually not in the suttas. Um, in the suttas, there is one sutta that starts with a difficult person, but uh, I don't think it's a very difficult person because that would be again too difficult. But uh, normally we would start with ourselves, a loved person or a benefactor, um, and then a neutral person or a person towards whom we don't have strong feelings of liking or disliking, let's say, and then a person to, to whom we find difficult or um, yeah, or with whom there are some kind of difficult history or um, there's some animosity, there's some ill will, because the whole point of this loving kindness is to overcome ill will within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Is it recommended to focus loving kindness more than on other aspects of the path if it feels right for one? Absolutely. I think if it feels right, then go for it, bearing in mind that it might feel right now. But again, you might change over time. <laughs> so there may be different things you're drawn to at different times in your practice life. And that's certainly been the case for me. Um, I used to practice mostly uh, Vipassana in the Goenka tradition, which was very, very much based on Vedana in the body as the um, central focus of the mind and developing equanimity towards that. So that was a kind of, I was thinking today when Ajahn Brahmali was talking about equanimity of diversity compared to equanimity of unification. And I thought maybe that was equanimity of diversity because you were just equanimous to any feeling, anything in the body and mind, you know, equanimity to the five khandas, basically, um, but not the equanimity of deep jhanas. But it was still very strong, a very, very powerful practice, which really served me well for a long time. But at the same time, I did some anapana meditation and also some metta meditation, but the vipassana was the most, uh, the biggest part of that. And the part that I was more drawn to, it was more helpful than any other. But at another point in my practice, I wanted to prioritize the anapana meditation because I felt like I wanted to deepen samadhi and I wanted to do it in a, in a way that would lead to deeper states of stillness rather than um, continuing more and more deeply into Vipassana. Or I actually felt that the stillness would help me go deeper in Vipassana. And along the way with that, I found loving kindness to just be um, another practice in and of itself, but one that combines really well with the breath. So... For example, I did a five week retreat once in Santi Monastery in New South Wales. And that was with um, Bhante Ujagara, who's one of my other main teachers, or my other main teacher really after Ajahn Brahm, next to Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> we don't want a hierarchy here, but he's another <laughs> really wonderful teacher. Um, and on that five week retreat, I would practice at least half the day of metta meditation, sometimes like all morning if I felt like it or all afternoon. Other times I'd sit for, I like to sit a lot. So I would sit for say two, three hours and I'd do the first half of that sitting just on loving kindness to really, you know, overcome any sort of lingering ill will or um, sometimes ill will in meditation just manifests as being a little bit too fault finding, you know, or just not being quite interested enough in your object. You know, you're just a bit repelled from it and you can't stay with it. So I do this loving kindness to the point where the PT was already quite strong, like the joy, the, the um, pleasure, the wholesome happiness was quite strong. And then I would simplify when I felt ready to the breath. But when I give these um, little uh, ideas, I'm just talking about my experience. It's not to make that into a method. Um, I've never made it into like some kind of um, trajectory that I have to follow. You know, I actually, uh, Think that with practice you start to become more and more intuitive about how to use these various methods so but give it a go I think if there's one thing most of us have it's probably a little bit on the side of ill will you know because we're brought up most of us I think I don't know if I can speak for all of us but I think most of us are brought up in sort of western education systems which are very much focused on critical thinking and you know finding fault and tearing other people's ideas down or you know so we really have this kind of fault finding mind and I think a little bit more gentleness and, and loving kindness is a really 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 helpful thing okay how many questions okay we're doing good about a year ago someone I love did something I found hurtful ever since I've been harboring a resentment toward this person I often have mental and emotional flashbacks of the experience. This person is still in my life and I'd like to keep them in my life, but I find it difficult to be kind to them and to myself for not being able to let go of this resentment. How can I practice with this and maybe let go? So firstly, it's funny, I always want to answer the questions backwards. It's like I always want to read books backwards. I don't know if there's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think firstly I would say practice in order to meet rather than in order to let go straight away 
because of course you want to let go, you know that, but give yourself time. Because whenever we think we're going to practice in order to let go, we tend to try and rush ourselves and we really need to give processes the time that they take. So you could try a forgiveness practice. I wouldn't say do it all the time. Um, I would say for the part where you find it difficult to be kind to yourself, for not being able to let go of this resentment, I would say just make loving kindness a part of your practice, loving kindness towards yourself, meeting yourself kindly, you know, in either of these two ways, either meeting your body and mind and just using mindfulness combined with compassion when you meet your experience or actively practicing loving kindness towards yourself. And then also the forgiveness part. Maybe you could do this even once or twice a day. I um. I haven't met this person, but I have had a wonderfully inspiring conversation with a Sri Lankan nun. Um, she's only a young nun, about 30 or so. But what I should say is she's only young, not she's only a young nun, because young nuns are awesome. But uh, I was surprised by her depth of wisdom, you know, for being quite young in life, in this life. And, uh, and she really inspired me. She said every morning when she wakes up, the first thing she does is um forgive everyone in her life like offer her forgiveness to everyone in her life including herself and it really helps to kind of clear the mind and it sort of puts her in a state of mind whereby she's prioritizing that so it's also like I said related to dying in a sense like if I'm going to die do I really want there to be any resentment so may I forgive but I would say rather than saying may I forgive, you could also say something like, um, may I learn to forgive, or um, I intend to forgive. You see, it's a bit softer. May I forgive is almost like a little bit demanding because you can't forgive. <laughs> but may I learn to forgive, it's like you're accepting it's a process. You're recognizing that it's a process. And also saying, you know, may this person know that I intend to forgive, something like that, you know, may they know I intend to forgive. It's like you're predisposing your mind to that possibility, you're opening your mind to that possibility. And you'll be surprised, you know, there may be just some time that you meet them and you'll find, oh, okay, maybe you haven't fully forgiven them, but there's a little bit less uh, force there, there's a little bit less reactivity. You know, you find you can have quite a nice conversation and you go back later and you're okay. You don't sort of dwell on the mistakes of the past. So give yourself a lot of time and maybe keep that contact with them um, limited to how, um, how much you're ready to see them. So really be kind about it and uh, give yourself a lot of time. I really trust in human beings, you know, that if they do have the intention, it will happen. As I said earlier, all we can really do on this path is try to put the causes and conditions, the motivations in place. The process is out of our hand. You know, the time it takes is out of our hands. That's nature. That's nothing to do with the self. If we could make it happen, we would, right? The Buddha said, if we could say, may my perception be like this, may it not be like that, then we could. But because it's non-self, we can't do that because we don't have control. We don't own these things. We can't say, may I perceive this person this way and not this way? You know, may I react this way and not this way? May I feel about them this way and not this way? Yeah. So we just take care of the quality of our intention. That's the most important thing. Okay, Dear Venerable, when I meditate, sometimes there's an, some involuntary movement happening. What is it? It's involuntary. And how best to deal with it? Let it be. Should I just let it be? People always answer their own questions. It's great. Should I just let it be and don't give it too much importance? <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly that. Yes. Yes. Because we don't know why and it's involuntary. So it's obviously something that your body knows more about than you. And sometimes we can keep sort of very deep tensions, even traumas in our body. The body remembers, you know, the things that have happened to us and it, it keeps uh, hold of these things. So sometimes when we meditate, because we're relaxing our mind, we're relaxing our body, some of these deep rooted tensions kind of come up to the surface and, and just 
come out. So it's very, very common, you know, to have some involuntary movement. I've seen people really having a lot. Um, I remember a girl in Nepal, she was, I think, in her late teens or something, and she was meditating, and her hands just started flapping like this, and basically just coming up and smacking her legs like this. And her body was like jumping. And it was really quite loud because in those meditation centers, it's totally like, you know, pin drop silence. You hear a pin drop. Um, and it was great to be in the room because, you know, of course, after a while I sort of peeked, opened my eyes, thought, what's this? <laughs> and so I kind of fly, almost like jumping off the seat. I think she was like jumping, you know, the bottom was kind of coming off. And uh, the teacher who was like my teacher at that time, because he lived in that center, so he was there for many, many years. Uh, he just sat there, carried on meditating with his eyes open, just keeping an eye on her, keeping a kind of reassuring presence. And we all just sat there. We all just carried on meditating for like one or two hours. And uh, I remember after that, we all left, but he stayed with her. I think they went to another room, which was a bit more relaxed, maybe his office or something. There were a few other people in there. And uh, she continued. This movement kind of continued for a bit longer. And the next day she came down for breakfast and she was serving the retreat. She just started serving the food as usual. She looked completely fine. She looked completely fine. And I think I said to her, you know, are you okay? Or Tapali Costa Cha, I think it was the Nepali. I've probably got it wrong. And <laughs> maybe that means, how, I think that might mean, how are you? Uh, and she was just like, yeah. <laughs> I almost felt like I shouldn't have asked. It was like, so what, you know, just so what? Yeah. Ajahn Bam also talks about people who sort of start to twist in their meditation and they're sort of in this really distorted kind of shape and then sort of ask them afterwards, like, have you had some kind of car accident because something weird was happening there with your shoulder? And they say, oh, yeah, actually I had a whiplash like a year or two ago. So, but these are things that people can pinpoint, but most of the time I think we can't because we carry so much, right? not just through this life, but perhaps if you're open to that, through many lives. Yeah. So yes, just making peace with these things, don't giving them too much importance. Because generally, if we give things a lot of importance, sometimes we can get almost like attached to these things, even though they seem a bit odd, we can actually get kind of anticipating of them, you know, and almost cause them to happen. And, uh, and that doesn't have to be the case either. So yeah, just keep making peace with whatever arises and all these little sort of movements in the body and in the mind will start to, to calm, start to subside. But we don't meditate to have them subside. We meditate just to open our eyes to what's happening, right? <laughs> to gain insight into this conditioned nature of body and mind and to see that it really doesn't belong to us. It's a conditioned process that we don't have so much control over. So. Good, I think I've got through all the questions. That's amazing. We're probably keeping them for Ajahn Bramali tomorrow. <coughs> so, oh, another message just came. Okay, oh, that's very nice. I just want to express my deep appreciation for your suggestions and wisdom. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's very nice to hear at the end of the day. And I also want to express my deep appreciation for your questions and your own wisdom in even answering your own questions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, also in putting questions to both Ajahn Pramali and myself, because it's uh, an important part of the practice, you know, to analyze, to investigate, to, uh, to inquire into the Dhamma, into what's happening, to try to understand. It's good, the heart and the head develop hopefully in harmony. So anything else before we end? Otherwise, I'm not letting you go early. We'll just sit for a few minutes in silence. Okay. Oh, something did come. How do you send metta to disturbing thoughts without keeping thinking about them more? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I would send metta to the thought directly. Mm, if disturbing thoughts come up in meditation, I tend to generally kind of not give them a lot of importance. That's my usual way of um, 
dealing with distracting thoughts or disturbing thoughts, I tend to put my attention elsewhere. And if that doesn't work, you know, for example, I'll be more in my body. That's a really good antidote, actually being embodied because thoughts are very much in the intellectual realm. Sometimes you just need to bring it back down to the energetic level. And you can even sometimes feel where the thoughts are bubbling up from in the body, which is really interesting. And the kind of effective quality that they have, like they, the felt sense of that thought in your body, it can be really interesting when you start to feel these things. Um, if that doesn't work and you're really stressed by it and disturbed by it, I would say just to send meta to yourself, you know, to that being that is being disturbed, just be kind with yourself. You know, give yourself some space, give yourself some compassion, make peace with the whole situation. But then I think in daily life, it's quite useful to learn methods to work with distracting or disturbing thoughts. And the, um, the best ones that I can really um, come up with, the best way to work with them is to just turn them into different thoughts. <laughs> so to actively think something opposite, which may be equally true. Um, so for example, if you have a thought like, oh, you know, I'm always failing at this or that, then I immediately say, actually, is that really true? Maybe you did well with this or you did well with that. And it's amazing that you'll often find that the opposite thought is at least as true or maybe more true than your original thought. So, <laughs> so that's quite interesting. I mean, I just talked to a friend before coming into this, uh, session who's a very good Dhamma sister I told her that's going to infuse this session for me with more meta and uh, she was talking about a couple of things in her life and the way she was thinking about them and I just kind of suggested a slightly different way to look at it like for example she'd started um, a job and uh, a training actually and uh, she's taken a slightly different route about it than usual so she has less um, security about the qualification she's going to get and also she's not getting any kind of um, stipend to support her through this training um, but at the same time she did it purposely that way to have a lot more freedom so she wouldn't be stuck in this training course for like two years so I just sort of said to her you know is there some benefit of having that you know is this a benefit as to why you chose the insecurity like what was the benefit that you could see from that and she said yeah the freedom I guess for you know having more time and as soon as she realized that she was like oh oh yeah you know you can see it both ways you could think oh maybe I should have done it the other way it would have been much more secure but there was a certain benefit in choosing to do it the way you did so we can just choose to turn things around a little bit look at it from a different angle and that's part of sense restraint as part of using our mind, using our way of framing our experience in a way that actually encourages um, good qualities to arise in the mind, you know, and overcomes things like fear, disturbance, agitation, um, doubt, etc. So it's a big topic, but um, I would say in the actual meditation, um, just see if you can let them be. That might be the best way to be kind to those thoughts. Just let them be there. Don't give them too much attention because as soon as you do engage, there'll be some kind of struggle to fight them away. So that usually makes them worse. And they just settle in time. You know, the longer you sit, the longer this retreat progresses. And it doesn't matter. That's not the measure of your wisdom as to how many thoughts you have, you know. <laughs> the real measure of your practice is how much wisdom and compassion you're developing in your heart so that we can always do okay so anyway let's sit for one minute together quietly to end this day i'll make a little gong in one minute
Very good. So take care, sleep well, remember to spread metta before you sleep. Maybe make the intention to forgive yourself, to forgive anyone else. And we'll see you tomorrow in the morning, wherever you're calling in from. It might be the afternoon. <laughs>